What I want to present is an update on the marine life data work that we've been conducting with two major NOAA labs, the Northeast Fishery Science Center and also the NOAA INCOS lab. So it's my lab at Duke University plus two government labs. We also have statistical support from a researcher at Loyola University. Um, in addition to myself, Jer Jesse Cleary, who's sitting here, is one of the main analysts for this project. So if you want to be able to grab him as well for comments in the aisles afterwards, if you have any specific questions. We were asked to put in a disclaimer, so here's our disclaimer, saying that all the work we're presenting is work that we've done independently and we're presenting to the RPB and the Marco process, the uh, Mid-Atlantic process and to Marco as well. And so the views and the data we're presenting is, for, is originating from us and is getting re reviewed by those teams. We've got a lot to cover here. We want to discuss um, the marine life data synthesis products and building on some of the raw data and models that have been developed over time. I noticed the, um, people were asked earlier how many people have been to these meetings before. A large majority seem to have, but some people haven't. And so we have a lot of material to try to co cover. And so we're going to kind of start at somewhat at the beginning and go through a march of a lot of analysis that's been done over the last several months. Um, we want to focus a lot on the data development, but also on the um, interpretation. And I'm going to stop several times during the presentation to make pretty strong statements about here's what the data says and here's what the data doesn't say. Um, and so that people, I want people to be very clear on their expectations on what, you know, what is the state of science right now with marine life data in this region. We want to talk about also focusing on the um, data that's going into the identification of ecologically rich areas and then talk about some of the next steps. We've been using this data pyramid as a graphic to help guide how we walk through this. So you're going to see this pyramid over and over again. I'm probably the most the person most tired of seeing this pyramid of anyone in the room, um, but it has been used. <laughs> It has been used extensively as a way to think about how massive amounts of data are being synthesized and aggregated together. So we're going to stick with it because it gives us a guide. The task we're really looking at is one of the tasks we were asked at, so we're going to focus in today, and that's the development of the synthesis product. So things we're going to focus more on things higher up in that data pyramid. So to walk through this data pyramid, we start at the base, and we're calling these the level one data products. And these are the closest to the raw data. And these are the products where we've gathered together um, many, many years, actually decades worth of data on fish, on seabirds, on marine mammals, and sea turtles. And we've taken that information and produced spatial um, models of the density and abundance of those species. And so this is the base of the pyramid. It's also the kind of scientifically strongest data because it's closest to the original observations. Um, but it's a huge amount of data. And so there's over 3,600 maps we've made that are at this level. And we're not scared off by that. We think that's a library. It's, and I'm going to use that term over and over again, that that's, that's the data resource that people are going to need to do hands-on ocean planning. But there's also a real desire to be able to synthesize and aggregate things in different ways as you kind of want to develop products that are simplifications of the data and abstractions of that data. So the next level up, and I'm going to walk through each of these, but just a preview of the process. The next level up is thinking about breaking up individual species into groups of species. So these are kind of taxonomic and other kinds of groups. Um, that we've developed with expert committees on what would be ways to aggregate groups of species together and make maps of those aggregated species. The next level up is what we're calling taxa synthesis products, where we're looking at the diversity and abundance of different taxa. And when we say taxa, what we mean is marine mammals or seabirds or fish all grouped together. Above that are what we're calling the multi-taxa synthesis, which is just saying, can we group things together? Are there places where we're seeing aggregations of marine mammals, fish, and seabirds all together? And at the very top, the kind of fifth level of this is to think about how we might aggregate some of this information together, coupled with other habitat information and other knowledge, to try to better define what we're terming ecologically rich areas. 
So a few things, starting at the base of the pyramid, we've been working on this for quite a while, and the NOAA labs I'm working with, plus my lab, have been developing these data products and models for many years. And in the last year, we've had um, expert review of these, synthesis, of these products for um, including more than 80 experts. Um, so I just wanted to make that point that a lot of the data that's going in and the initial maps have been re reviewed by taxa experts. Um, we've had like nine sets of webinars and other things with, with experts in each of these groups. So there's been a lot of more academic um, review of these, of these products at that base. One of the other things I want to make a point about is when we start thinking about the synthesis products, they're meant to supplement the base data. We feel that the base data is the most important data, and it doesn't. when you create some aggregated product on top of that, it doesn't mean that overrules or takes away the, the base products. It's just to add to that. And so we think of these as supplemental information that might help managers, policymakers, planners, um, stakeholders to be able to um, look at different things that emerge out of the data, but it supplements the raw data. Okay. So we want to make the point that the data and models at the bottom of the base of the pyramid here are still going to be fundamental to ocean planning. Okay. So I'm going to say that theme over and over again. All right. A couple of caveats to start out with. One of my favorite quotes, being somebody who works with data all the time, is a quote from um, George Box. It says, all models are wrong, some are useful. And I like that one because whenever you're taking aggregated scientific data and aggregating it together, um, there's going to be error, there's going to be assumptions, there's all sorts of things to think about. And the real cautious way to think about these things is you're trying to be as explicit as you can and you're trying to see what do you gain by doing these steps and what's the useful parts. So a couple points. The synthesis products provide a means to distill multiple data layers uh, in time periods into simplified maps. These maps require implementation and decisions that are made and I'm going to be going through some of these kind of decision steps because we need to think about, well, how are we going to aggregate what species, what time periods, things like that. And there often are many, many different choices. And so we just want to be very clear and, and very conservative on what steps have been made, what choices are made, and to acknowledge that there could be other ways to do things. Okay. Um, the resulting maps represent patterns in the available data and models and may not fully characterize features of interest for specific ecological or management decisions. So there have been um, issues that people have brought up on ocean health and other topics, and knowing exactly where the density of fish are may not tell you specifically about ocean health. It may, you may be able to infer some things from that, but whether or not it directly tells you those things are, are the points I'm trying to make here. And we do want to mention that developing targeted queries of species from that base data is probably the, still the most reliable way to go back and answer specific ocean planning issues in the future. So the National Ocean Policy Task Force mentioned many different types of issues they feel that ocean action plans should try to address. And these are areas of high productivity, high biological diversity, key species, ecosystem function, resilience, spawning, breeding, feeding areas, rare and vulnerable species, migratory corridors. It's a lot of stuff. And one of the points I want to make in a real expectation check is that the MDAT data that's being developed is actually some of the most, um, you know, one of the largest exercises globally right now on aggregating marine life data in the world. I mean, this is amazing amount of information for the mid-Atlantic region that's being put together. But that data really does just directly tell us how many and what type of marine animals are found. And so that helps us answer several of the first questions. So high, you know, areas of biological diversity, where are the key species? Um, but when we start getting into some of these other questions on resiliency and function, that's going to take a lot of other further analysis and expert knowledge. And so I just try to be very cautious, like I said, careful to think about what, it, what does the data tell us and what doesn't it tell us. So currently, there's a desire in the Mid-Atlantic region to try to define areas that, of importance, and the term we're using is ecologically rich areas. And right now, the first steps towards that is to, divide, to, to define areas that have high abundance, core abundance in marine animals, and then couple that with ecological features, things like 
corals and canyons and benthic habitats, and then to be able to map those things out. And so I'm gonna show some initial process towards, towards those goals. So we've got a flow chart here of the work literally for the last six months or so that I'm gonna walk through and walk through all the different steps because it's a lot of work and a lot of different decisions and processes that, that go into this. So at the very first level, we're thinking about the individual data products. And I'm just gonna show one example of each of the different taxa. Um, this first map here is showing an example for um, humpback whales. And what we have is one month um, for humpback whales. So the map on your left is humpback whale density in the month of July. And so this is a model taken, derived from many, many, many years of observations of humpback whales using oceanographic variables to be able to predict the patterns. On the right-hand panel is a map of standard error, which is a st statistical um, description of the amount of error you might assume, and it gives you some confidence in higher or lower confidence in the model predictions. So the main take-home message here is for every piece of data we're developing, we're also trying to develop statistical um, maps that let us do a better job of communicating the confidence we have in the data. This is showing one example from the seabird side. We're looking here at surf scoter, and this is spring relative abundance. And then here we're looking at a 90% confidence interval range. So just showing another example, different taxa, and then also slightly different ways to map out our uncertainty about the, the predictions. And the third one here is looking at from the fish side. This is from Northeast Fishery Science Center, and this is looking at biomass. Um, we're using for the fish data using biomass, not abundance. Abundance is a count of animals, and with fish you would end up skewing things because you have many, many, many small fish. And so we're using the biomass as a way, as a, as a better indicator for, for fish. Um, and so here we're looking at biomass for um, butterfish, just as an example. And there are many different fish data sources that we have available for the Mid-Atlantic. So this is data collected from the scientific trawl surveys from the Northeast Fishery Science Center. We also have data that's closer to shore from the NEOMAP data set. So this is showing an example for um, Croker. And um, these, these data are collected with slightly different methods, so they're not exactly comparable. But we're trying to show spatial coverage by having the data sets that are more offshore from the federal trawl surveys, and then here the nearshore data to show we're trying to um, get better coverage for, for fish for both those regions. So at this level, this is the base data. This is where I f find the data to be um, closest to the actual observations. Um, the issue here is it's thousands of data layers, more than 3,600 data layers we've created. And so I think of this as a reference library. You don't have to look at all 3,600 data layers at any given day or time, but it's really good to know that they're there and you could query them. And if you had a question and, you're, and you wanted to look for these species, um, all that data is going to be there and available. All this data is going to be made available through um, links in the Marco portal. And also another point I want to make is that the same data layers we're developing are very being consistently used in other activities. So federal agencies are using these um, with their consideration for Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, and other, other considerations. So the same data, and this is extremely important for the region, is that the data you guys are using for marine life analysis is gonna be the same as, as federal agencies and other groups. And so there's a consistency there that I think is extremely important. So now the next step is marching up that data pyramid is thinking about how we might aggregate some of these individual species into groups or clusters that might make sense. And so the species groups are developed to allow us to have some more quick access to um, hopefully logical groups of species. And it might indicate species that are of different sensitivities. Um, and the idea is that there may be ways that people might have questions that they might ask at that broader level. So here, just to show a couple of examples, this is for marine mammals. Um, you may be interested in knowing, well, where are the baleen whales? Or where are the small dolphins? And aggregating multiple species together. So we've already clustered those things together and then done analysis of those different taxa groups. You may also be interested, or where are the Endangered Species Act listed species? 
So that could be a really popular kind of query. So we've put those kind of things together to make condensed maps that, is, that show those. Um, you may also be interested in other types of things. So we have an example we're going to show on sound sensitivity. So one of the big issues with marine mammals is how, uh, what part of the sound range do they use and would they be sensitive to noise disturbance in the ocean? So that's a kind of an example of a, of a potential sensitivity. So to start out with the kind of taxa groups, this is showing an aggregation for small dolphins. And I mentioned already that we're doing these things at multiple scales. So you'll see a map here showing models of small dolphins from, for the entire Atlantic seaboard, and then zooming in on the mid-Atlantic region. And so we're, we're, as we said, we're operating at multiple scales so that we can zoom in and zoom out and look at the importance and the distribution and the context. Because I do think it's important if you're doing ocean planning in the mid-Atlantic that you actually look at the context north and south of this region. This is looking at baleen whales, similar example. And then here is looking at the tooth whales, sperm whales, and beaked whales. And what you might notice from those three examples is they have very different geographic distributions. So there's really di gross differences in thinking about where are the small dolphins, where are the large baleen whales, where are the deep diving sperm and beaked whales. So they're actually in very, very different kind of geographies. This is an example of this sensitivity map that we've put together, and the idea here was to break out the different species of marine mammals by their sound hearing classes. And the issue here is that these are the parts of the sound frequency where they listen. And so the sensitivity is to ocean noise masking. If we put a lot of noise in the ocean in those frequencies, it might disrupt the communications for those animals in those ranges. Um, and so this is something that we fig we thought that people might be interested in, and it's a product that we could pre-prepare that so people don't have to go in and do individual queries and do the analysis. We already have this packaged for them. Another example here is from the seabirds. So similarly, they put together separate maps for different managed species, um, different spatial categories, nearshore species, offshore pelagic species, coastal waterfowl species. Um, as well as some sensitivity. So they had species broken out by higher sensitivity to collision or higher sensitivity to s displacement. And so just to show one example here is this is from the avian bird group from NOAA, and they put together high displacement risk species. So like I said, all these kinds of aggregations are groups of species we've put together and kind of prepackaged these queries because we think they may be useful for, for planning in the future. So that was one example at that, that level. Moving up the next level is, can we aggregate multiple different species groups together? And so here we're calling these taxa synthesis products. And the things we're interested in here is total abundance of species or species richness, um, the diversity and richness of different species groups. So here is looking at marine mammal abundance. And so this is all species of marine mammals clustered together, okay? And what you can see from this um, is you will actually see some hotspots kind of emerging um, where you'll see you know, a large abundance of marine mammal species near the coast, mainly small dolphins that are dominating that. And then you're going to see on the coastal shelf break uh, where you see large abundance of different species because you have a lot of the um, migratory and deep diving animals that are offshore. So you kind of see those kind of breaks emerging out. This is looking at the seabird distributions. Um, you'll also see um, concentrations of nearshore coastal seabird abundance, but then also offshore more pelagic seabird abundance. And then here we're looking at, um, instead of abundance, we're looking at biomass, which is the kind of the weight of fish, but from different taxa. And we're looking at the different species here of, of biomass. And so you can see a um, from Hatteras to Canada, and then we're looking, zooming in at the mid-Atlantic region. And as I said, we have the fish data broken out into the more offshore federal NOAA trawl surveys, as well as nearshore near data as two different products. 
So I was looking at abundance. That tells you how many or the biomass that you have of each different species. Now we're thinking about richness, which is how many different species in, are found in the same geographic areas. So this is looking at the avian species. And so the count here, the map, is going from, in this case, we're going from 17 to 32 species. So it's a count of how many different species are found. And this is at an annual time step. This is looking at marine mammals. And then this is looking at fish. So this is a count. So when we think about this, this is just how many different species are generally found in these, these areas. And then also the nearshore diamat fish as well. Another index that we put together is looking at diversity. So uh, when we think about uh, species richness, it's just a count of species. There are statistical indices that are commonly used to look at um, what's called diversity and evenness. So this is an index that's commonly used called a Shannon Diversity Index. And it's looking at the distribution of species, how diverse is an area, and then how even is that distribution. And so this is one that's commonly used in the academic community. So if, you are, if one of your goals is to look at biodiversity in the ocean, these are the kinds of indices that people use to characterize biodiversity. Now, this next level here is one that is really important. And that's what we're calling core areas and core abundance areas. We want to be very clear about this, this issue and this topic. Whenever you show a map like this, the first thing people want to know is, well, where's the hot spot? Where's the, where's the special place? And usually your eye is drawn to, if you have a color ramp that goes from you know, cool colors being low densities to warm colors being higher densities or abundances, then you think, well, it's that warm color there. That's, that's where we have a lot of that species. And so what we've been working on is ways to, how do you tease that out in a way that's reasonable to pursue? And there's some issues here, and I want to try to see if I can explain this in a way that hopefully might make some sense. If you had three species, and they had broad ranges, and you thought about it like a Venn diagram. Everybody remember Venn diagrams from elementary school? You look at the overlap of things. If you had three species, and they had ranges where they had a core area, and then they kind of dispersed out to their periphery, if you just naively just stack them all up, what would, could happen is you could end up saying that the most diverse, the area that has the most overlap could actually be at the periphery of all three species, um, which would not be really good because you could be the places where you're right at the limits of the ranges of all three species and, um, and you'd be saying, well, we're counting up that we got all these different species here, but it's actually really rare <laughs> that you have them there. And so what we're trying to do is see, can we actually get the geographic core and then look at stacking up the geographic core areas. Does that make sense? We'll see. OK. Um, so we've got some methods that we're using to try to do this. And one of the ways we're trying to do this is to see if we could define what portion of this map contains a core of some population of the species. And you could say, well, what threshold should you use? How much of the species? So one way to start is to say, let's start with all of them, or most of them. And so we're looking here at just humpback whales as an example. And what we've got is the range for 99% of the population of that species. And the reason we're using 99%, not 100%, is that you could have some really, really predictions that are really, really, really small. OK, 0. 0.00001 humpback whale. And so, so that's at 99%. And then if you said 98%, you see it's a smaller area. And then 90%, and then 75%, and then here 50%, and I could keep going. Um, and so the idea here is trying to say, what's the geographic area that would contain some level of the annual population? And we could do this throughout the year, or we could do it for every month. Um, we could do it for seasons. So there's many, many different choices that could be made. So it's, hopefully everybody's, is this pretty intuitive, the idea that we're trying to carve out, well, where is that central core area that we, we be, you know, may want to focus in on? Um, so what we're trying to do in some ways is balance this geographic and demographic coverage of the species, but then also the specificity. 
Um, there's been issues in the past with ocean planning and fisheries management where you end up defining so much of, of area as important that it becomes meaningless. And so this kind of issue has happened in the past where if you, if you don't have any specificity, then why are you bothering going through this process? Because you want to be specific enough to be able to say, you know, these places we think we have confidence are core areas. Uh, okay. So I'm going to show a couple things here that might be take a little while to explain, but we're going to try to just get the, the important message out is we actually went through an analysis of all the different species and plotted out all sorts of iterations to show where do you find the, the sweet spot for what the thresholds should be. And the thresholds can be different for each species. So this is an example here where we're showing for North Atlantic right whale, we might find an optimum, and this is looking at one month, that the optimum area might be at a certain threshold. And for humpback whales, it might be a different threshold. Um, and we presented this stuff actually at a Marco meeting back in July, and we showed that we could do this, we have the capabilities to do this, but it was actually fairly complicated and would require you to do this in a lot of ways in a more dynamic way. To be able to do ocean planning at a monthly time step is the way to be most efficient. And so we kind of were a little more conservative and said, well, let's just start with using a baseline of a 50% threshold instead of fine tuning it for every different species. Because it's also more difficult to explain to managers and policymakers and stakeholders why every individual species has a different threshold. And so we were using as a baseline a 50% population threshold. That's an arbitrary decision, but it's a starting point. Um, just to show you one example here, and I'm not going to dwell on this, this is using, this is for um, five different species here, um, and what we're looking at is the change over monthly time steps. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if you wanted to do this, one example would be implementing core areas done at 12 months of the year and that you'd have a different core area in a different place for humpback whales in December than you'd have in July. And that's the most efficient way to do it, and we can do that. But it's extremely difficult to show that to planners and people that you have migrating core areas, dynamic management. This is what we'd love to do, but we're trying to ease people into these ideas by starting out with kind of basic annualized maps first, but this is where things can go. Is everybody pretty clear on this idea? Okay. Um, so this is looking at an example here of the 99% aggregation, 75%, 50%. So this is taking the core areas for marine mammals to start with and saying if we took the core area for every species and then stacked them up, how many core areas overlap and where do they overlap? Okay. And so the 50% one there is showing the number of core areas for species and where they, where they overlap. Now, another issue when you're doing this kind of aggregation is to say now that you've stacked up a whole bunch of species and a whole bunch of their annual core areas, what's the top part of that stack? And there's different ways that people working with geographic information do this. One way is to use a statistical method, the standard deviation, to say where's the mean value and how far away are you from the mean. Another way is to use what we call an equal interval, where you say, let's take just the top 10 or the top 20%. Um, and a third way in the middle is to use an inflection point called a natural break in the data. Um, we chose in the examples we're showing here this natural breaks method because it's actually the middle of the road method. One's more conservative, one's more liberal, so we're trying to pick a method that's somewhat in the middle, okay? So from here, what I'm showing here is a map of the 50% um, abundance threshold for core areas for marine mammals. And this is the 50% abundance threshold core areas for seabird species. And then this is the 50% biomass threshold for core areas from the um, NOAA trawl surveys. And then it's probably a little harder to see here because it's close to shore, this is the 50% biomass thresholds for species from the NEOMAP surveys. So trying to walk you through these steps because as we start to aggregate things, there's choices that have to be made. 
at the very kind of getting towards the top of the pyramid here, we have all abundance of all species. And the issues that we have to deal with here is if we start to take the species data and combine seabirds and mammals and fish together, um, we do need to consider some differences in the geographic extent. And the area that we're covering with mammals and seabirds is different than the area we have available with the fish data. And it's an unfortunate fact of life that the fish trawl surveys um, don't extend as far offshore. Um, and don't extend as far near shore in some of the cases. So they limit, if we try to aggregate all three together, we have to have the lowest common denominator, denominator spatially of where we can map things. So this is looking at some of the data. So this limitation is once we combine the taxa all together, we can only do that combination to the, ex the furthest extent that we have for the minimum, the, the minimum species. The fish species data does not give us enough range to cover as far out as we could go, go, go with marine mammals or seabirds. So this is looking at combining just the mammals and avian species, which do allow us to go fairly far offshore. And this is looking at avian mammal species um, richness and then adding in the fish species, you can see it only goes out to the shelf break, okay? So this is all three species richness of all three taxa. Now, this last step is taking these things together, taking the core areas and trying to combine core areas for multiple species. So this is looking at multi-taxa core abundance areas, so where we find the, the abundance that's 50% of the population for all marine mammals, seabirds, and this is marine mammals and seabirds alone, and then this is all three, mammals, avian, and fish together. And as we said, once we add the fish data in, it limits our geographic scope a little bit. Now, that's building us all the way up to the point where we can say, can this information help inform the definition or identification of potential ecologically rich areas. And so the kind of general concept was to be able to take the abundance data from marine life data and then overlay that as well on some special features of interest, um, deep sea canyons, corals, and benthic habitats. So Going back to this slide I showed previously, we would need to be able to go in and find the core areas for the abundance for the species and isolate out the top categories from that. And so you can see we're using that natural breaks one to identify these subsets. And then be able to take those four different taxa together and, and isolate them out. So this is one of potentially a suite of maps that could be developed. Um, and this is one using the assumptions of that 50% threshold and other criteria I just described. And the green polygons, which are probably a little light to see there, are showing areas for um, marine mammals for high core abundance. The kind of purple ones are showing um, core areas for seabirds. The dark blue are showing um, core areas for fish. And then the corals are drawn in separately. That was showing it for the entire Atlantic seaboard. This is zooming in just for the mid-Atlantic range. And why there's a difference is if you're thinking about what's important for the entire Atlantic seaboard, you're looking at a larger area. And so what's important for the whole Atlantic seaboard might be slightly different than if you're looking just offshore of Delaware or just offshore in the mid-Atlantic. And so, um, so we're doing this at multiple scales so people can see the difference. Generally, when you zoom into a region, not always, but generally, you're gonna find at the regional perspective, things may be more regionally important and maybe their importance isn't quite as high if you think about including the entire Atlantic seaboard. Okay. So the last step here in this process is to take these core abundance areas, adding in corals and canyons and benthic habitats, and then see about how we might combine these things together. And this is probably the ugliest map 
we're going to show you all day. And we kind of left it there on purpose because we didn't want to read too much into it by making it look really, really wonderful. Um, because it is noisy and messy. Because when you start adding in all the different patterns of benthic habitats, um, where we have corals and canyons, we do end up with a lot of disparate and um, kind of emergent patterns that are coming from different data sources. So what we wanted to do is take you through this process, and I know you've got bearing with me for a long description here, of logical steps, hopefully logical steps, of moving ahead, um, and then thinking about how this stuff can be useful. Um, where we are at this point is we've got all the single species work has been done, the species groups are complete, the synthetic products are complete, and we've gotten to the point where we have draft, ecologically rich area methods and inputs, um, but we're gonna need a lot more review and work on how would people assemble those things together, what's the information that can be gained out of these last steps. So we wanna be very, very cautious and conservative on saying we have put the data together, we've got it, now we need to see is this actually gonna be useful and how do people want to interpret it? Okay, so we didn't want to take, our, take these last steps of us interpreting it because it needs to be something that the RPB and expert review teams need to take a look at and chew on. So last expectation check here. Um, really, these products explore the first components of emerging ecologically rich area definitions. So they tell us where the core abundance of species are and habitats. Um, they tell us how many and what species occur in the region. They don't directly tell us about a lot of these other questions. So they're not really telling us about resilience or ecological function or ecological health. Those are things that we would need to do further analysis and this might inform part of that, but it's not a direct way to just translate places where you're finding lots of animals to say these are healthy or not healthy places, okay? Well, I'll leave that there. So thanks for bearing with me with a lot of technical issues, but we're trying to build up the process that we've been going through for months now on aggregating this data. So happy to take questions.